everyone. Hello, everyone. Today, I have a very special guest with me for the Tawahado Bible study. I have with me Deacon Daniel Kakish. Am I am I pronouncing that right? Yeah. Okay. Because um, I, I want to make sure we get that right with one of our fellow brothers in the so-called Oriental Orthodox or Miaphysite communion, our Orthodox Church, our one holy universal and apostolic church. And I want to invite our brother to pray for us to begin this meeting. Thank you. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one true God, amen. Lord, thank you for this opportunity uh, for us to even be allowed to talk about you and talk about your word. And uh, give us grace and uh, lead us with your Holy Spirit always. Um, our Father, who art in heaven, our Lord be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts and sins, as we forgive our debtors. And let us not enter into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for starting us off the right way. And let's start very simply and, and very basically for our audience. I think I told you this a little bit off air, but this is basically there are so many categories of knowledge. The Orthodox Church is this giant ocean of wisdom. And there are so many areas that people will be in. Some people are generalists and some people are specialists as much as possible. You know, I try to be niche and one of the niches I'm trying to focus on is b biblical exegesis or interpretation and, and how how we have done it, how we have this a long tradition of it, you know, from the school of Antioch all the way till today. And so that's just kind of the background of the folks who are, tend to listen to this podcast. But could you just tell us a little bit about your faith and how you got to the present moment? Sure, sure. So um, I was born and raised um, evangelical. Uh, I wasn't... I wasn't baptized as a baby. I didn't have any, there was no apostolic influence in the Christianity that I grew up in. Uh, and so, and I was always very involved and I was very devout and my family was very devout. Uh, my dad was always one of the leaders in the church that we grew up in. I was always like very interested in the Sunday school and worship and then later on in like the the, the Bible studies, and uh, it, it was it was always a key part of my life. So uh, one day, uh, my cousin he told me, "Let's go." This is maybe I was in my early twenties at this point. My cousin told me, um, "There's the there are these apostolic Christians who want to talk to us about, uh, you know." The faith, I'm like okay, fine. You know, in my in my experience, Orthodox and Catholics don't know anything. And so, uh, I just had some verses ready about salvation. At the time, I believed faith alone, and once saved, always saved. So, uh, I had my verses ready. I even fasted that day. I didn't eat anything, and then I went uh, to talk to these people, and they they blew me out of the water. To be honest, uh, they knew the Bible much better than I thought I did. Uh, and they told me something that that stuck with me ever since is that me being a student of history, they told me, um, okay, but the the students of the apostles they didn't they don't agree with you that their Christianity, <laughs> their Christianity is different than yours, and I was. In a, in a sense, I was kind of ashamed that me being uh, so interested in history and studying history, it never occurred to me to study Christianity after John or mm -hmm. after the apostles. And so uh, in the master's program I was in, I began to go into things because while I was studying like my thesis and my concentration, I would also kind of get distracted by other th things that it re related to this, what we're talking about, yeah. that I see in the library or whatever. So then I began to read 
and look into it. And I read people like uh, Ignatius of Antioch or Clement of Rome and the Didache and these types of, of writings. And because, you know, my my opinion, and I even had said that to these people that I that that told me that my faith was not apostolic. I told them, what do you mean? Christianity was exactly like how I believed for the first 400 years and then it corrupted. I just assumed this and believed mm -hmm. that there was no evidence for what I believed. So then as I'm reading Ignatius, I think it was like the, f the first paragraph of what I was reading from him at first century, right? Like I, he died in 107, but first century faith that he's talking about. So um, right away, I'm like, oh, wow, this is not what we, this is not what I grew up understanding regarding things like the Eucharist or the authority of the bishop or even baptism. Clement of Rome talks about apostolic succession. The Didache talks about things like um, saying the Lord's Prayer twice a day, once in the morning and once in the evening, uh, and many other things, even the way it kind of implies about living Christianity and salvation is that nobody is saying something like all you have to do is believe and once you get your salvation that's it it stays with you um <laughs> nobody is saying anything like what I'm used to hearing so then that's not there are no creedal Christianities in the first few centuries meaning meaning yeah. in the sense where it stops at the creed there's there's faith in action or there's trust in action faith working through love Absolutely. deeds Absolutely. Uh, it's this whole process of growing in holiness. So um, from that, it was maybe two years later. I, I was in denial about it for two years. And I didn't stop with those writings. I kept going. Like I started, like Letter of Barnabas or even later, Irenaeus and Justin Martyr. Uh, Justin Martyr, I still don't, I still can't forget what he said in his defense to the, uh, to the emperor the emperor was persecuting us for cannibalism. Mm -hmm. Justin Martyr had the opportunity here to simply say that the Eucharist is just a symbol. He yeah. could have said it. But instead, he says, he, it's two birds and one stone in this. That's why I can't forget it. He says, just like how we are truly born again when we're baptized, we're transformed, which I also didn't believe at the time, uh, That uh, the same way, the bread changes into the body of God. I think this is in his first apology, chapter 66 or something. I don't exa no, I remember exactly where it is. But he says something of this sort. And as a Protestant, I, uh, I what, what can I say? Can I say Justin Martyr and Ignatius and all these people were wrong and Daniel is right? In, <laughs> you know, 2000, whatever the year was. Um, and eventually... Eventually, I just had to come to, to terms with it. I even I even tried to find a Protestant church that believed in these things. But then I realized after reading Clement that you need apostolic succession. So, um, sorry, I don't know. The, <clears throat> um, then, I lost my train of thought. It's okay. You were talking about how you were reading the early apostolic fathers and, and how that got you to your current priest track or, or entering yeah, yeah. into the diaconate eventually in the Syriac yeah. Orthodox Church or yeah. the Apostolic Church. I'm, I'm also, by the way, just interested in, in the terms. Sometimes Ethiopians, you know, will will refer to other members of our sister churches and, and they use these terms that we'll use, you know, but each, each member of the one church kind of describes the church differently. And even in Ethiopian history, we've used different terms at different times. Even the word Tawahado that we use now is it's a little bit uh, polemical because of a certain controversies that, that arose in the 1800s. And yeah. I noticed, for example, that the Armenians often refer to themselves as apostolic. So I wonder how, how is it that, you know, the Syriac refer to themselves as opposed to imposing another label upon them? I see. So the word we use in Syriac is pretas shubho, which means, uh, it means correct faith. That's that's literally what it means. So this it's the eta so the, the, the Syriac, the correct faith Syriac church. Okay. So that's the equivalent of the word orthodox then. Yeah. 
Right. Um, and I think Tuwahido means uh, one. Yes, it's the the act of being made one, and it's in reference to his his incarnation. You know, so it's yeah. like saying Mia Fizai in in Gaz. I, I don't I don't necessarily think that's negative. Um, it's true. Oh, yeah, it, it's not negative. The reason the reason I I mentioned the the polemics behind it is when you read some older writings, some of the Ethiopians they simply refer to the church as the one church you know, in some of the ways they describe it when they're talking about the church. And, and later on, different people get weird theological controversies. And to settle these, these controversies, we had local, local councils, actually. And okay. in one of the local councils, that name won out. And so, so people authoritatively will say something like that. But it, but it becomes funny sometimes because, you know, they'll say the Syriac Tawahado Church or the Armenian Tawahado Church. And, it, and, and it's true. You know, yeah. it's true because we have the same Christology, but it's yeah. just a little, it's a little funny because you don't see those people referring to themselves that way. So whenever another group of people are, are naming an, uh, another group, I, you know, I, <laughs> I, try, I try to let people define themselves, you know, yeah, as, exactly. as long as it's within reason and it makes yeah, sense. I didn't know that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's cool. Yeah. So, so you, you were studying these matters in, in your in your master's level and you were ruminating and, and chewing on it for a couple of years, you were saying? Yeah, yeah. So then on Holy Saturday of 2013, uh, and I it's still there there was for sure divine intervention in all of this that is God's grace that brought me to the Orthodox Church. Even the day that it happened is him, it, him doing it, because I didn't know at the time a difference in calendars and even if I did know it it didn't occur to me when I was making the inquiry to get Chris made so I called the Abuna and I said uh, I said Abuna I didn't say I want to convert or I want to be Christmas I didn't say anything like that I just said Abuna I want to take communion mm -hmm. uh, so I said okay um, uh, were you baptized as a baby I said no uh, I was only baptized as an adult. So he said, okay, come, um, come and we'll chrismate you and you'll take communion. So I went and I was chrismated and I received communion on Holy Saturday. And that's mm -hmm. after the day that this happens. It would just happen to be the next day that I called. I called on Good Friday, not knowing that it was Orthodox Good Friday that I had called. So uh, it's just, it's amazing that how, how that worked out for me. Uh, and then I just I just kept getting deeper and deeper into these fathers that I had started reading, and uh, I went to the parish. Uh, the, it's obviously in you know the the priest he speaks Arabic, so the homilies were only in Arabic, but mm -hmm. my my uh, like my academic language is English, so mm -hmm. I studied in English, uh, so I continued to do that. Um, to read the fathers and um, eventually in January 2018 uh, Sayyidna the, the bishop he he tonsured me a subdeacon and um, and then later on that same year another bishop said that he thinks I should go into the priesthood so I started that process on the East Coast, actually. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I came back here under this archdiocese. It worked out for me to be back here. Uh, and I'm still on that, that path right now. I go to Agora University. Amazing, yes. Uh, it was Dr. Michael Wingert who introduced us and we uh, already actually knew each other on, on Twitter. <laughs> I didn't realize till later. I didn't <laughs> but, either. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but uh, sometimes that happens on social media when you have certain similar niche views you know you're you're in the same circles and you're bound to to run into each other what what i hear throughout this time is the passion with which you know you are able to see how faithful these early apostolic fathers were to christ whom they were introduced through some through personal testimony but later on through the holy scriptures and you talked a little bit about when you were a protestant you used to be active in, in certain bible studies i i wonder how has your your view of the bible changed or or stayed the same you know throughout all this time of 
of I inquiry. And, and you said you were at least able to recognize, you know, the, the biblical literacy of people. And it was the biblical literacy of the apostolic Christians that, that drew you over into at least giving them a fair shake in reading them, which, you know, not, not everyone does. So there is a certain amount of trait openness, I think, that at least you displayed in, in having that. Yeah, th there are two key differences in the way I understand the Bible. Um, the first one is it's so much deeper that, and not just the deeper, but also the humility in which we, uh, the Orthodox Church, reads the Bible, that is what allows it to be what it's intended to be. Um, versus before when I was a Protestant and I would read it as if I am the interpreter. I am the final authority of God's word. I am the infallible Pope, so to speak, right? That is gone. Now I'm coming in to read what it's telling me exactly for what it's saying. For example, get up, be baptized, and wash your sins away, Acts 22, 16. Which Protestant is ever going to talk like that? So if, if a Protestant is speaking to someone who's trying to convert him, and he tells him, He's not going to tell him, get up, be baptized, and wash your sins away, because it's against their theology. But this is how the apostles spoke. And then we have, and then for me to to now be able to read this, and this is, and just take it for what it's saying, because this is exactly what what the person who's saying it is trying to say. And then now there's all of these church fathers who have interpreted it before me for two thousand years, and they're canonized, they're saints. So. And their interpretations are some things that, as hard as I could try, I can never come to that point at how beautiful the things they write are. That's the first thing. The second thing is, particularly Syriac, uh, the Syriac tradition regarding interpretation of the Bible. Uh, that, I find it so beautiful and rich and deep. And this is why I became Syriac Orthodox versus, um, I don't know. At the time, I didn't even realize there was a difference between us and the Chalcedonians. But mm -hmm. thankfully, I still chose it because of its beauty. And then realized that uh, later I realized uh, about Chalcedon and all the other stuff that happened. I was like, yes, I, we were, on, we're on the right side. But... Um, for, for like Ephraim, I, I was talking to Dr. Mike about this. Uh, the way he describes what happened to St. Mary at the Annunciation, where he says things like, the kindle, uh, it's, uh, the coal kindled the thorns and from the curse from Adam, he's saying. So when the Annunciation happened and Jesus is the coal, so the, the curse of Adam was gone. That he entered into humanity and uh the way he puts some some of his poetry he will put words into the mouth of the people that were there so like he'll have mary saying some stanzas and then there'll be kind of a dialogue so with mary she says uh he i put on his robe when he baptized me and he put on my robe in his humanity kind of thing and things like this is he, I, I believe, and I, I, I'm obviously biased, but I believe that Saint Ephraim was the greatest poet ever in anything, of all time. So I, I don't, I think he was truly inspired. And then when you read the Bible with Ephraim, Ephraim's way of thinking, it becomes this huge, like mosaic. You know, it's no longer just academics and text and scholasticism and legalism latin protestants stuff it's not yeah there are there are some good expositors it's not like there are zero good expositors i mean you mentioned some earlier amongst the latin fathers for me it's jerome and ambrose especially Jerome for his dedication to the Hebrew language and learning that Hebrew language, which gives him a little bit of the Semitic mindset. I actually put uh, a lot of the, the, the value and the expression of the Syriac fathers and later the, the Ethiopic or Ge'ez fathers. Yeah. Uh, I think part of that is the Semitic mindset that they brought to it. And although some of them read the Greek and the Latin, not that many of them read everything. And so 
their their mindsets were less adulterated, were less influenced by these by these other forces, like you said, of scholasticism and and legalism, of overanalyzing, of inserting words into the Bible that never existed into the Bible. Whereas some of these Western fathers, and by Western, I'm going to be saying Latin and Greek for us, because we're yeah. in the, the deep oh. east. <laughs> um, while while they try to flex their own intelligence or their own ability to to reason and to present something as elitists for an elite audience i find the syriac fathers like ephraim like isaac like jacob of sarug like philozenus of mabug i find them in addition to the ethiopian school of biblical exegesis the ethiopia is interesting in that it took its its liturgics or its hierarchy and its form of worship from alexandria but really the school of B biblical exegesis it had, it it brought from from Antioch, from from Syriac, and um, that's due to some persecuted early nine Syriac saints who came early on and did a lot of translation work and and built nine monasteries and as you can imagine, you know, spread helped spread Christianity early on in its infancy. But uh, we, we've had that Alexandrian and Antiochian influence from the jump, and for me, that is Christianity, you know, along with Rome. But that is Christianity, especially as it was started by Paul and Mark. In, in those areas in Antioch and and in Alexandria and what I see from from Mar, Mar Ephraim um, Mar by the way is a funny word <laughs> yeah, I know it means Lord in Syriac but I, in Amharic I can't help but think it means honey in Amharic and that's one of those false cognates but you know it's it's great to think of either the honey yeah. or the Lord Ephraim <laughs> Yeah, and his words are, are as sweet as honey as you as you describe. So the way I, I think about it is like Mar Ephraim is is cinematic. He's he's presenting to you with his words a way of of giving you that feeling that you felt on the eve of Pascha as you were getting baptized, which is I, I'm not in any ordinary place anymore. I'm in an extraordinary place. I'm being transported to the realm of, of the sacred scriptures, to the realm of the Holy Bible. And, and, you know, just like that saying you said, he's putting her clothes on, right? And she's putting his clothes on. Mm -hmm. Somehow humanity and divinity are being made one and, and for our sake, out of the, the deep love, the endless love that Marisak always talks about. Yeah, so, yeah. And Ephraim, he also says, he also says, uh, "Glory to you who uh, who put on words for us." So even to give us words that we can talk about him, he did that for us because that's there's no words that can describe him, but he put on words for our sake, so that we can talk, we can have this conversation. Yeah, it's <laughs> it's mind boggling, right? Like, you know, so, some people in our tradition and in others, we'll get into crazy philosophies and, and discussions about what if ever was the first language, you know, what language would God speak? But as you say, you know, and as uh, there's a Amazon TV show drama that says this and makes this joke as well, God's language is ineffable. It's unspeakable. And so it, it's through his condescension, through his decision and, and grace to shine favor upon us that that he's revealing to us any words at at this moment um you know i know i know you gave us a few examples already but if if you got i know you had sent me a commentary on on ephraim if we could go deeper into to any any other quotes of biblical exegesis or any other way in which the approach of any of the syriac fathers focus on 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 the bible i'd i'd love to hear any any final thoughts on that um Sure. So he he always ties in everything to paradise and Genesis and re, uh, restoration of humanity. So, uh, for example, we a lot of the current hymns and parts of rites we use today in the Syriac Church come from him. So, mm -hmm. for example, in the baptism rite, we say. Uh, for the, the baptized, um, Adam Adam has leaped back into paradise and can now eat again of the tree of life. So, because now we put on that glory that he had originally created us in, and then when we when we sinned, it was stripped from us. 
but and when we get baptized, we put it back on because, like Saint Ignatius of Antioch said, uh, he left his he le uh, when uh, when he was baptized, he purified the water for us, and then Saint Ephraim builds on that and says he left the robe of glory in the water for us when he was baptized. So we put that back on, and we go back into paradise, and we eat from the tree of life, which is the Eucharist. He says in a poem, um, "Sad." was the tree of life that Adam was taken away from it, only to spring up again on Golgotha. And the fruit that hangs from the tree of life is Christ. Amen. That's beautiful mirror imagery. It's yeah. like he's personifying that old tree from which humankind falls. And then he mirrors that with the tree of the cross in the place of the skull in Golgotha, from which we now are able to get back up. <laughs> yeah, he says, through one tree, man uh, left paradise, and through another tree, man re-entered paradise. Amazing. Amazing. <laughs> Amazing. Well, th thank you so much, uh, Deacon Daniel, and I'm sure you're going to be a regular guest on, on this program. Uh, and uh, I'm sure our, our own friendship will blossom and, and we'll get these churches interconnected and, and focused on, you know, growing together in fellowship so we realize that you know heaven is not just a bunch of syriac heaven is not just a bunch of ethiopians but you know all of us together as as we're as we're mixing and matching could you close for us with um a paschal greeting and then either the the lord's prayer is a big part of this podcast i usually end it in in good as i love that you opened it in in english could you close it in in either arabic or or syriac and and yeah, whatever yeah. the paschal okay beautiful and whatever the paschal greeting is i i don't i don't know it so maybe you'll you'll be able to teach me the paschal greeting what do you mean oh so like say to each other yeah okay. yeah yeah okay Maran min qabro. this is the um the Syriac form, uh, like when the Syri and then the the reply is Shari So, uh, Shari Yeah, uh, Christ uh, Christ rose from the grave, and the the response is truly he rose. Uh, Amin, Amin. Yeah. Thank you, thank no you problem. so much, thank you so much. And can you close us out? Yeah, go ahead. شم أبو وبرو روح القديش وحاد الله شريره عن أبونا بشماي ونث قداش شموخ تيثي ملكوثوخ نهوي صبيونوخ أي كانوا بشماي وفبرع وهبلان لحم وصن قونان يومونو وشبقلان حوبين وحطوهين كانوا دوف حنان شباق الحيومين لو تعالى نسيونو إلو فاصولان من بيشو ميتود ديلو خي ملكوثو حيلو تشبحتو العون المينا Amen. Thank you. Thank you for that. Thank it's you. um 